at the state and city level. They were known as political machines. They would trade jobs and government contracts, and they would fight over who the nominee was going to be at the national level. President Lyndon Johnson of Texas and Senator Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota. Those party organizations uh, begin to lose strength as you go through the 20th century. You hear a lot of talk about reform, and attention starts to focus on, well, could voters really have a say in nominating the candidates? doesn't really go anywhere except in the South, where the primary becomes the tool used by the white supremacists to make sure that uh, the whites wouldn't be splitting their votes and a black candidate winning. You move up into the, the 60s, and the primaries are still they're there, but they're not dominant. It's still kind of the party machine, party organizations, the state national level that are making those choices. So you move into 1968, Lyndon Johnson was running for president, but he is weak because of the Vietnam War. He has a very close election win in the state of New Hampshire. As a result of that, and seeing that it was going to be a slog for Johnson to win the party's nomination, he surprisingly pulls out. I shall not seek, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. His vice president, Hubert Humphrey, jumps into the race. And Humphrey is organizing that state and national party apparatus that Johnson had behind him so that by the time you roll around to the convention in Chicago, Humphrey's already, in effect, won the nomination, even though he did not run in a single primary. Now that is the old party structure, but parallel to it, you had folks like Eugene McCarthy, Robert Kennedy running in the primaries, and they were winning. I do not run for the presidency merely to oppose any man, but to propose new policy. Kennedy, of course, is killed by an assassin. Eugene McCarthy rolls into Chicago, and him and his supporters are outraged that Humphrey's going to be nominated, even though he has not won even a majority of the delegates uh, through the primary system. Humphrey's playing by the rules of the game. They've just, they've lost credibility over the decades. Chicago was an extraordinary moment in 1968. You've got mass protests over the Vietnam War and also great resistance to the economic inequality, racial injustice in the country. The Chicago political structure is controlled by Mayor Daley, who is outraged by these signs of protest. And as later reports would conclude, there was a police riot. The police just went crazy and they were beating up the protesters outside the Democratic Convention. This is on the streets, is mayhem. Well, they all have different points of view and there are some powerful leaders. So they get down to a convention and you can expect to have something happen. We have one factor that seems to heal, uh, to cause a healing process to speed up, and that is the Republican opposition. And as the convention is coming to a close, you've got this rebellion within the convention hall and the critics in the party are saying this is not democratic. Meanwhile, on the streets, you've got the students and the socialists and other protesters saying that the party is not democratic, that America is not democratic, um, and it is a real crisis. One of the last acts of the convention, 68, was a referendum to start an investigation to look into how the party nominates its candidates. One of the results is the adoption around the country of direct primary elections to select the uh, presidential candidate for the Democratic Party. I accept your nomination with a full and grateful heart. 1972, this process we're talking about is why there is no political party to step in and say, Mr. Joe Biden, thank you for your career, but you're not going to be the candidate. If you were in Germany, France, or England, you would have had the party leadership uh, ushering them off the stage. There would have been some kind of intervention. My vision for America's future all merited a second term, but nothing, nothing can come in the way of saving our democracy. That includes personal ambition. I'd like to thank our great Vice President Kamala Harris 
She's experienced. She's tough. She's capable. She's been an incredible partner to me and a leader for our country. In America, there is no power. There is no party there who is going to, you know, move the candidate out. The candidate controls their own destiny. I knew you were still there. You're not going anywhere, Joe. I'm watching you, kid. I'm watching you, kid. I love you. I love you, Joe. The purpose for the primaries, you know, back to 68, was more democracy, get people involved. This needs to be about participation. But what we found over the decades is the proportion of people turning out to vote in the primary was very small. 15, 20, sometimes very competitive election, possibly 30%. And the people who were turning out were not representative. They tend to be more liberal, and especially on the conservative side, very conservative libertarian. And it helps to explain why Donald Trump, you know, has locked up the nomination, even though there are plenty of Republicans who have doubts about him. The people who show up at the primary are making the decision about the nomination. Now we're looking at a situation with Kamala Harris being endorsed by Joe Biden and other leaders. And we're going to have kind of off-road sort of political maneuvering. There's going to be a lot of coming discussion about whether this is democratic, whether there ought to be an open convention to decide it, whether having the delegates vote virtually without any kind of public debate is really a violation of democratic procedure. And my point here is, go back to the beginning. The way this was set up in 1972 and how it's evolved into really a process of relatively small numbers, more extreme elements of our political process participating, has guaranteed this was not gonna be democratic.